All right, hello everybody, and welcome to a uh, fun little discussion here uh, on uh, buffs, debuffs, and how mastering them is basically going to be more important than any kind of levels that you can go rack up. Um, so. Uh, without any additional ramble, let's uh, go ahead and get this thing going. So, what you need to know is that uh, buffs and debuffs, in especially Reborn, but really just Tactics Ogre as a whole, always have a lot more interactions than they say they do. Um, and in fact, actually, a little bit of a funny side note here, uh, Eagle Eye uh, still refers to uh, ranged attacks being deflected, even though they're technically considered parried now. It's a slight adjustment, it's just a word adjustment from PSP, but either way, it doesn't matter. So. Um, so, for example, like, let's say, you know, if we want uh, debuffs and whatever else, a player first coming in might look uh, look at something like a longbow here and think, oh no, this thing, it does one damage if I shoot it. That is unfortunate. This class must be bad. And yes, I know, I harp on about the archer thing. I love archers because they're so dang uh, good at uh, turning things around. But anyway, so, like, for example, we take a look at something like Eagle Eye, and we start off with... 100% buffs is uh, kind of our first uh, port of call here, and we see that, okay, there's going to be different flavors of these. Some of them will guarantee crits, some of them will uh, essentially count as overpower attacks uh, from the PSP version. So, basically what this means is that if somebody has parry or deflect or whatever else, if somebody's got eagle eye or they've got vigorous attack or something like that, it will blow straight through any defense they've got, and also has 100% in its description, which means that everything associated with the attack is 100%. So, for example, this uh, happy little bow over here has a charm effect on there, and suddenly this one damage bow became your instant mind control gun. So, you know, it's it's things like that that you really want to be uh, mastering in order to uh, kind of uh, achieve your uh, kind of like power gains uh, as the game goes on. Uh, because there's a lot of fun little tricks you can do with this. So, like right there, you know, one damage archer, doesn't matter. He turns on, on Eagle Eye, and suddenly whatever damage this guy does has become my damage. I don't care if he's got parry or reflect or whatever else, he is guaranteed to, be, guaranteed to be charmed. Now, there's only a couple guys left on this team, doesn't particularly matter. But anyway, uh, let's go ahead and uh, carry on with this uh, fight here, just to uh, just to kind of uh, cover uh, debuffs a, a bit more thoroughly here. So, like, let's say we take a look at uh, one of the uh, one of the most common ones, a stun. I don't believe this team uh, currently has it on there, but either way, moot point. Um, so if we take a look at stun, um, it, all it is is just the ability to get rid of a turn roughly 50% of the time. Now, back in the PSP version, uh, this actually had a secondary interaction where it would prevent counterattacks. This isn't the case before. Uh, this isn't the case anymore, but the mechanic is still technically there. So uh, stun. Like, really, just removing turns on its own is already pretty darn strong. See, the thing is, it's a debuff that you can apply in bulk. Now, you might be thinking I'm talking about Paralytic Wave, which there's ways to increase the odds of Paralytic Wave hitting. I mean, it's hitting in an AoE, so that's pretty darn uh, fantastic there. But overall, we want to be going for something a bit more, you know, impressive. So, if we're uh, going for, uh, for stun, again, you know, going back to the archers, my favorite thing is just Bowgun plus one, Eagle Eye, or Tremendous Shot they're going to be putting stun absolutely everywhere. But ninjas can do the same thing. Uh, you also have uh, stun weapons available on most of your uh, melee characters. Warriors and uh, Terror Knights can guarantee these. But if you're looking, uh, just so you know, for that uh, ability to turn off counters, it turns out Curse does in fact still counter. So Curse, Curse is one of the ones that's actually been buffed quite a bit from the PSP version, because before it was uh, Curse, Wither, and um, Enfeeble, I believe it was. Not Enfeeble, um, what, whatever the hell the other one was that nobody ever used. But basically, uh, it, was, uh, it, it originally was uh, reduce HP by 10%, reduce MP by 10%, then 15% variance, and then it had uh, all of them, uh, well, that is to say, Curse had the ability to turn off counterattacks, and then, and anyway, point being, it was a kind of useless mess as far as all those went, so they all just got, got combined into Curse. Um, because realistically, who's removing 15% of somebody's MP and hoping that that, like, negative 2 MP regeneration per round is really going to do anything? Um, so, so in this case, yes, both uh, HP and MP are reduced, and it gets rid of the ability to counter. This debuff is not very common, but I just want to throw it out there that if you're looking for a debuff that turns off counterattacks, it's there. It's a thing, and uh, uh, the easiest and most consistent way to do that is a Dark Priest. Um, basically, uh, the Dark Priest slash Heretic uh, will, uh, will basically delete units in an AoE around her. It is easily one of my favorite classes this time around. It is hilarious that she can throw out four different debuffs, technically two Two of them override each other, but that's why you use them both at the same time, so that one way or another you end up with something devastating. Um, 
Either way, point, point being, uh, yeah, like, she just has automatic debuffs for days, and it is absolutely hilarious. Okay, so, let's talk other debuffs here. So, some debuffs will be blocked uh, by certain uh, resists, some will be uh, technically considered immunities for bosses, um, and then some of them have a few other little quirks to them. So we're just go, I'm going to go ahead and save this real quick. Uh, so, let's go, let's go ahead and take a look here. So, for example, uh, we uh, we already talked about uh, uh, talked about stun there. Stun will affect most bosses, but there is one here uh, that does not affect uh, many bosses, and that's going to be fear. So, fear is your next one that is absolutely devastating. Uh, basically, it reduces. See, like, oh, okay. You, what you have to understand is the damage formula will essentially approach that damage number from different directions. Okay, so. For example, arguably Breach and Lament of the Dead and stuff like that will technically do the same thing. They are causing you to do more damage to the other guy. Technically so does Strengthen. But, or, or like let's say something like Spellcraft, but all of them approach this from a different angle. So something like Strengthen increases your maximum physical damage by 15%. When it gets to the scaling part of the calculation, it scales up the damage by 15%. That's it. When it comes to, to something like Fortify, it counters Strengthen, so it basically will reduce the scaling of maximum uh, physical damage by 15%. Meanwhile, something like Spellcraft, um, on the other hand, uh, and again, all of these are available from buffs, uh, if you don't want to talk about uh, buff cards, but all of these are available from buff items. So, for example, uh, something like Fortify here will, like I said, uh, reduce scaling damage by 15%. Uh, strengthen you can get off the Ariana and Plume, by the way. Um, but then you have other ones here, like, uh, for example, the Spirit Stone with Spell Craft, and this increases the penetration of magic. So basically, when it comes to the armor calculation of everything, it will get past armor better. Um, but technically, it isn't really scaling the damage up much. One way or another, you're still technically improving your damage one way or another. It's just these little minute differences that cause certain buffs to work better under certain cir uh, circumstances. So, for example, say a spellcaster is having a harder time versus a bulkier unit or one with high resistance, that's when you'd put on something like spellcraft. Meanwhile, if you have a melee character that's, for example, fighting something with lower overall armor but higher overall bulk, uh, then something like strengthen might be good for them because it'll it'll basically help them carve through a bigger health bar, uh, but it won't necessarily do anything uh, versus armor. Um, meanwhile, uh, we go down over here to something like uh, Sidestep or something like False Flight. Uh, these are what we call not very good buffs. <laughs> uh, realistically, ranged attacks pretty much always hit 100% of the time, so it's it's very oddly specific for those to really be needed for anything. Those are like challenge run only category. Um, then you have something like Enfeeble here, which causes somebody to be uh, hit more uh, more easily by magic things, basically doing the opposite of that... Um, of that uh, Spirit Stone and the Stars up here, causing them to be hit more by magic. Um, but then you have something like a Haunt Stone here, uh, causing the physical accuracy of somebody to go down. This is melee only. So if it's a Strike, that's going to be melee. If it's a Flight, it's going to be, you know, arrows and things. Um, generally speaking, though, uh, something like a melee debuff is... It's another one of these buffs, like it strengthens fall, your False Strikes, your Breaches, all that kind of thing. These are all non-standard debuffs, so these are things that basically will affect everything, it'll affect bosses, it'll affect everything else. So, for example, something like a False Strike and a, uh, let's say, a Weaken, uh, from a Brand of the Sacrifice here, are two buffs that will completely neuter many bosses. So if you're having trouble with Oz, for example, you might consider putting a uh, something like a Brand of the Sacrifice and a uh, Haunts Tome on the guy. Uh, not the cheapest items in the world, but they are useful for those oh crap moments. Uh, but basically, you put those on your uh, frontliners, and then suddenly that uh, big boss that you're afraid of is going to be a lot, uh, a lot less hard hitting. Again, these are roughly 15% uh, debuffs on the scaling side, and considering most of the big numbers will be a result of uh, scaling going crazy, these will very effectively potentially reduce their damage by like 40 to 60%. Even though realistically, it scales down only by about 15%. Again, this is just fiddly background stuff, don't worry about it. Point being, they make damage number go down. Just so you know, though, um, because I've seen this come up a lot, buffs, debuffs, whatever else, these are all well and good. The reason that your units are getting one-shot is going to be elemental weaknesses, like, 99% of the time. Um, like in, in a lot of cases, folks will just immediately think, oh, the stats are too big over here, or the buffs did nothing. 
No. If there's an elemental weakness, you might as well consider it the effect of like 30% extra scaling in that particular situation. It varies based on the type of move that you use. Um, but for example, if you have something like, let's say, Oz, and he's got an elemental weakness on your unit, it doesn't matter if they're technically classed as a tank. If you have an armor-piercing armor, armor -piercing shell hitting a tank, that tank is now a wreck. It, is, it does not matter how, you know, bulky they were. They were hit by a thing that hard counters them. <laughs> so uh, think of the elemental weaknesses as uh, just kind of being able to bypass the defenses of a particular kind of unit in certain circumstances. So, for example, many of those Knight Commander bosses will have uh, will have moves that will be able to bypass those defenses by having an elemental version of a thing on there. So, for example, like if we look at this guy's finishers right here, somebody that's uh, maxed out on axes will be very good against lightning units because of this infinity uh, attack over here, and also will be very good against wind units uh, because of the uh, ice prison over here. Uh, these other two are a bit more situational, uh, depending on whether you need a silence attack or whether you need a double hit for one reason or another, like if they've got, uh, say, some crit cards stacked up. Um, but either way, those big uh, big elemental uh, hitting moves, those are going to be what ends up uh, one-shotting units 99% of the time. So don't assume that your debuffs didn't work. Most of the time, that's what happened. So, all right, back to what all of these debuffs do and their fun little, uh, little interactions here. So, again... All of these item ones, by and large, are going to be so stuff that will work on bosses. Um, so some of them, again, are still situational, like something like True Strike or True Flight. There's not many situations that you'll need them, but still, you know, if you're doing a challenge run, if you're doing something like, say, a really, really low level run or something, that's when you'd need buffs like this to potentially overcome some of those, uh, you know, agility, not, not quite uh, matching up to avoidance type situations. Um, now... Technically, some of these defensive ones, like dodge, for example, like dodge, sidestep, uh, those increase your evasion versus a certain thing by about 20%. Um, the interesting thing about this is I believe the numbers are a bit wilder than it says, because just keeping uh, one dodge item on, uh, uh, on the ninja for most of the game here uh, has resulted in him constantly rolling that 20% dodge chance. Please bear in mind, parry on a lot of these weapons uh, is going to be maxing out probably about 30-40% or something like that. Um, so realistically, you're just stacking additional layers of defense. Uh, so that 20% uh, uh, dodge is a lot a lot more useful than it seems. The thing is, you don't... like it, It's one of these situations where you want to build them to be able to take a hit. So for example, like, you know, dodge item on a ninja, perfectly fine. Usually they'll have something like steel stance on or whatever else. But it's essentially 20% uh, better chance to survive during those times that their skills don't proc. So either way, just kind of something to consider there. This is, uh, by the way, this save file is in POTD. So uh, yeah, Palace is a bit more, a um, bit more intense <laughs> to the point where, uh, realistically, I don't think uh, I don't think that Ninja is going to be surviving much of anything. Um, that's why I don't have it on him at the moment. But something interesting to consider is that uh, in many of these cases, these items will actually cause a sort of bottomed out value effect. So for example, uh, putting on something like a uh, dodge will basically mean that they have 80% dodge, uh, rather uh, it kind of maxes out the hit rate versus the guy to about 80%, okay? If you have a additional debuff item removing the accuracy of the opposing unit, that's another roughly 20% uh, that it's affected. Um, this works a bit differently than it did on in the PSP version, because in that one, it simply added a certain value to the total percentage. In this one, it seems to cap the maximum, so to speak. So, interestingly enough, this does mean that uh, if you are very wildly unable to dodge something, a dodge buff will basically just lock away 20% of their accuracy that they can't do anything about, uh, minus 100% uh, hit chance moves. Um, this additionally also seems to apply to... Uh, uh, to stuff like Spell Strike, which increases the uh, the overall accuracy of your uh, debuffs. So, interesting thing on uh, Spell Strike here, if I actually remembered to pick up one of those, I believe that's... no, that's a Spoil Heal... there's a Spell Strike somewhere in here. Here we go, Black Lizard Powder. So, interesting thing on, sp on Spell Strike is that it also seems to bottom out in the other direction, that if you have 0% chance to hit, something like Spell Strike will give you 30% chance to hit. Um, if you are above 30%, it will boost your odds, just like it did in the PSP version. So this, this is interesting in that it basically allows impossible things to hit, and this is the same buff that comes from Concentration, so in a lot of cases, that 0% will just lock itself to 30%, 
which is just a funny little interaction, and believe it or not, 30% in most cases is still going to be worth going for. Uh, so for example, like let's say we have a caster that's, uh, that's coming in over here, and they've got 30% odds to hit a poison cloud, okay? So like, let's say they've got a choice of a Thunder Flare that's gonna do roughly 200 to each tile, and then they have a choice to uh, use a Poison Cloud um, at 30% odds. So realistically, at 30% odds, you're looking at more than likely one or two of those is going to hit. Now, just based on the odds, realistically, in most of the time, it's gonna be at least two that end up getting hit, right? If we're looking at that damage, that is still essentially going to be roughly, roughly being about 360, uh, if we're comparing the numbers there. Uh, again, this is just kind of ballparking numbers, but if you're doing about 200s with the uh, regular spells, you're probably doing about 120s with poison. That's going to trickle in three times per round, and roughly speaking, that's going to be uh, that's going to be dropping in about 360 uh, per uh, per enemy turn there. So you're getting a far better return out of these low percentage moves than it seems. Some of them are a bit more situational, like for example, a charm is, a, is only a single tile, but being able to hit a charm at the right moment, it's a great little Hail Mary move. If you have a unit that's giving you trouble, like again, like say something like Oz, um, and you're just having a hard time uh, keeping up with them, Something like slow is worth it. If you, uh, if you, for example, have something like concentration on there, and you end up uh, putting a torpor on there, uh, then still that's going to be thirty percent. It's going to more than likely uh, be a lot more effective uh, than uh, than attempting to go for damage in the right circumstances. If you've got an elemental weakness, sure, go for the damage. But in this case, slowing them down could be just the thing you need to kind of get the fight under control, so to speak. So just kind of something to consider in that situation there. All right, let's get back to some of the more standard debuffs here. So fun thing on fear. So fear is one of those ones I was mentioning earlier, like breach, that technically uh, affects defense. But the thing is, it affects everything. Like it affects everything overall. So when we're looking at fear, it's basically a reduction in the actual like penetration values um, of that unit. So for example, their, uh, their armor threshold goes down and their ability to penetrate armor goes down. Now, again, these are not hard numbers that I can specifically point to in each situation. They are going to vary. Um, everything about this damage formula is going to vary, but this is just the easiest way to think about it. That it's lowering the thresholds of those enemy units. Which basically means that if you were to, say, surround a unit by uh, with tankier units, inflict fear on them, they're more or less going to be pretty near useless. So pretty much any unit in the game can be very heavily neutered uh, by something like Lament of the Dead. Now, this becomes increasingly likely to, uh, to trigger as the game goes on, and additionally becomes practically guaranteed uh, by the time you get to rank 4. Um, I believe these are roughly the equivalent of... Uh, of uh, about uh, about two ranks of the original, uh, if I were to guess, um, because it in the original version it started off at thirty percent, and then it went up by about five percent uh, every time that you ranked it up, uh, maxing out at uh, roughly seventy percent, and then you could potentially use some items to boost it further. I believe it does max out about uh, seventy eighty percent at this point because it rarely ever misses for Mister Gerald the Generic Terranite over here. Hey, a uh, quick thing I wanted to kind of throw in here, uh, so we're clear. Uh, so the automatic uh, debuffs, basically anything that's going to have a rank on it, if there are exceptions to this, by the way, I apologize, but as far as I'm aware, anything that has a rank on it will follow this rule. Uh, but basically, these are set percentage chance to hit. Uh, they're not taking the unit's uh, mind or anything like that into consideration when it's rolling for a chance. So this is going to be stuff like uh, Lament of the Dead or, for example, like, let's say, Iron Maiden or Bloody Gag, things like that. Like, basically, if it's got a rank on it like this, it's going to roughly be just rolling for a chance to uh, hit that is independent of uh, the uh, unit's respective defense. Um, or resistances, or mind, or any of that type of thing. It's not a um, it's it's not a stats per stats roll. It's just a set percentage. It will happen if it if they're not immune to it thing. Uh, so, for example, uh, Lament of the Dead. Assuming it follows the rules how I think they do from before, I assume rank one will be about the equivalent of uh, rank two from the BSP version. Uh, rank two, the equivalent of rank four. Rank three, the equivalent of rank uh, six. And rank four, the equivalent of rank eight. Assuming that's the case. Uh, we're looking at uh, somewhere in the ballpark of about 40% uh, uh, chance to hit at rank 1, 50 at rank 2, uh, 60 at rank uh, 3, and 70 at rank 4. 
Again, this is just a rough ballpark. Um, as far as I'm aware, nobody's pulled out those exact numbers as of yet. Uh, either dang ways, um, again, this is just completely independent. If the other unit is not immune to it, uh, then this is just going to, uh, to roll as is. Uh, we don't see the odds come up uh, because it triggers as an automatic, but still, that's roughly what that's going to be. So this is basically what makes a lot of these automatic moves way more reliable than a lot of the other ones. Um, so, for example, a unit with really high mind might make excellent use of something like Paralytic Wave or Poison Cloud, but a unit with Lament of the Dead can be a complete and utter moron and still be able to uh, trigger the uh, debuff just fine. Uh, of course, the uh, the stipulation being that they have to be in close proximity, um, as opposed to, you know, uh, basically just launching the thing from a mile away. So this is especially scary in situations like, for example, Howl on the, uh, on the Cyclops, roughly equating to somewhere about 70% uh, locked in uh, hit odds uh, once they end up maxing out Howl. Um, yeah, once you see groups of these showing up in elemental temples, it's uh, it's a little scary. You kind of want them to just never get close because your turns start disappearing. Uh, like, stun is really just one of those big momentum-changing uh, debuffs that, uh, you know, one or two of them, not super threatening. Once you start getting into the three or four range, um, your turn, your uh, turns don't work anymore. <laughs> so just, uh, yeah, just something to bear in mind. Uh, Howl is scary. There is a reason that uh, the final... Well, that is to say, the final boss of the main, you know, first part of the story there um, is uh, is going to be coming in with it because it's easily one of the scariest freaking moves in the game. Anyway, all right, moving on. Um, so either way, if you're ever having an issue where a a non-boss unit is giving you trouble, fear is going to absolutely break them in half. I mean, lament doesn't sit, like it's one of these things where you don't rely on it to trigger every turn. But if you just situate this unit in the front line, they are going to automatically just cause this constant momentum shift in your favor. So fear, uh, as it stands, is very, very fantastic for that. One thing to bear in mind, though, as far as fun interactions go, though, is that it does prevent the ability to be recruited. So if a unit is terrified or they're charmed or anything along those lines where they cannot speak or they cannot think clearly, they will not be open to recruitment. Uh, you can't make a contract with somebody that's not in their right mind. I mean, technically, you know, the corporate world has something to say about that, but that's a story for another day. I either way, point being, you are not allowed to recruit them because they're not in their right mind. So, uh, let's uh, move on to some other debuffs here in their fun interactions. So, something like sleep is fairly obvious. It puts the unit to sleep. It puts them out of commission. Fun note: A sleeping unit that misses their turn, if they have an activated move, that turn will that activated move will simply expire. Uh, this was actually not the case in the PSP version, where they would just continue keeping that move on until they woke up. Uh, in this version, sleep does allow their uh, their moves to expire, so it's a nice little way to uh, have a little bit of a low uh, hit chance uh, kind of backup plan um, when you have something like, let's say, a Gorgon Key that becomes active or a Dragon Scale that becomes active. Sure, 30% hit odds through concentration is not the greatest odds in the world, but, you know, if they're far away, they don't have much better to do. You know, realistically, okay, they can do 1 to 200 damage with missile spells. whoop de frickity doo -da. A kill is not a kill, unless it's a kill, so you might as well try to disable them some other way. Um, anyway, uh, let's uh, go ahead and move on to some other ones here. So uh, we get something like Charm. So Charm is another little fun one uh, as far as interactions go. Um... So this is basically the equivalent of Charm and Bewitch being mixed together in the PSP version. Technically speaking, it's more like just Charm by itself, because Bewitch was a weird one that confused a lot of people. Um, basically, Bewitch in the PSP version was a more advanced Charm that was harder to get rid of. You couldn't really get rid of it through hitting that unit. Um, it was functionally speaking straight up mind control. Um, including the, the uh, fact that it uh, reduced their loyalty every round, which is one of those things that's like theoretically cool for recruitment and stuff like that but realistically it like it takes such a long time to use that it's mostly just you know kind of an annoyance if somebody manages to have the wrong unit hit by bewitch right before they're trying to do some kind of plot event um but either way so anyway uh so as far as this one goes um uh, basically you've just got uh, charm available in bulk it doesn't last very long typically one to two rounds Actually, one thing I should have mentioned up to this point is the fact that debuffs, typically speaking, uh, will be checking uh, your mind score versus the other person's mind and resistance, uh, which will um, uh, which will then uh, 
uh, basically decide the duration of the ability. So instead of doing damage, they are basically going and they're targeting RT, like in terms of uh, how long it ends up landing. So a unit with higher mind will typically end up lasting, uh, end up uh, landing debuffs that will last dramatically longer. So just kind of something to bear in mind there. Um, all right, next debuff, now that we're actually just here, is a Boon of Swiftness, so basically just causes RT to tick uh, down faster um, for about, uh, roughly about two rounds in most situations. Again, you know, see mind from before. Um, not too many interactions with this one, aside from the fact that it no longer counters uh, slow, or rather, it doesn't counter all versions of slow. So, so Boon of Swiftness, again, just causes RT to tick down faster. But then on the flip side, you have something like slow, which will cause it to uh, uh, to uh, tick down uh, tick down slower, right? But the funny part is that there's actually a second version of slow this time around that comes from archers. Uh, so those archers over here are going to be coming in with uh, with leaden, which is uh, technically it starts with archers. You can also do it with uh, like a cyclops and I believe frost dragons or something like that. There's a few sources for it. Either way, uh, point being, it uh, causes them to uh, to leaden, which has a secondary uh, slow effect. So like leaden is one of these fun ones where just like think about it as just messing with somebody's ankles, right? The dark weight is just shooting them in the foot more or less. So it causes them to not have the ability to go up or down more than one uh, one time. Oh wait, hmm. sorry, throws being weird. Causes them to not be have the ability to go up more than uh, one tile. Um, so for example, if they're a flying unit, they will be grounded. Um, if they're a teleporting unit, uh, they will similarly be grounded. Um, nobody's really immune to leaden. Um, additionally, if they are having any kind of evade buffs active, it will cause um, it will basically tilt that completely away uh, because it causes 40% uh, more accuracy versus that unit. Um, now, whether or not this applies to debuffs is a little unclear. Um, like I, I could swear I've seen that uh, actually work that way in some cases, but not always. So jury's still out on, on that one specifically. Um, but additionally, uh, it causes a secondary slow effect. So you can double stack, like for example, leaden and slow on one unit and make them incredibly, incredibly slow. And again, most bosses uh, are vulnerable to both leaden and slow, just so you're aware. Most, not all, but either way. All right. Next up, we have something like a Fall Strike. We already talked about this one earlier, but it is funny to put something like Smoke Screen and a Dodge item on a Ninja because it causes them to uh, to just evade a lot better. Just uh, kind of something to bear in mind. They are the evasion specialist after all, just so you know. Oh, and actually speaking of 100% uh, hit chance moves, uh, you may notice in many cases, uh, actually I, I recently changed this guy uh, because he's uh, he, he got a fancy new sword and I wanted him to, uh, wanted him to wear the thing. Um, but something to bear in mind is that uh, ninjas have a kind of alternate version of that 100% uh, hit chance thing, uh, which is the weapon buff. Um, now, the weapon buff is something that's going to function differently in different circumstances. The elemental buffs uh, will cause 25% uh, bonus damage on top of whatever you deal um, that happens to be flavored like the respective element. Mostly it's just, it is that color. It doesn't really matter too much in terms of, you know, overall scaling. In the PSP version, you specifically would instill somebody into a particular element to train their augment uh, with their weapon. In this one, it's not really something to worry about that much. Um, but either way, uh, just so you know. Uh, but then uh, you got the weapon poisons as well. So something like in Venom will have 100% uh, chance to poison. At the same time, the fun thing is that uh, you can actually have multiple buffs coming out of the same weapon. So, for example, this guy is realistically only going to be doing one damage with whatever bow I give him, so I might as well give him the lightest bow that he can carry, uh, since the Damascus blow bow, you know, might technically do more damage, but that's two extra weight. Meanwhile, the short bow plus one has a stun effect on there, and for example, we can have him uh, guarantee in Venom, but then have a chance to roll stun on top of that. So potentially this might be a very, very good, you know, just kind of throwing out uh, debuffs type of ninja here. So that's particularly fun there. Uh, once again, uh, like his guarantees are coming from a totally different direction uh, where he has a different form of concentration, which allows his abilities to hit with 100% accuracy. No, I don't know why they gave it the same name, but whatever. But for example, he's got Shadowbind here, giving him 100% chance to stop, but he's got almost no odds of landing this in any other situation. So, 
again, just there's a lot of little interactions between all these little buffs to potentially consider that are just kind of fun to play around with. Um, so, for example, one thing I particularly like is uh, is having uh, spear units uh, that will be running something like the scorpion. I believe I have that over on my dragoon here. So, for example, the scorpion, if they're if used with a slayer or bane move. Um, or rather, uh, if it used with a Slayer move, will guarantee that poison versus the unit that they're targeting. Um, that is to say, like, if it's a, a dragon or a beast or whatnot, right? But then at the same time, we have something like Vigorous over here uh, that uh, will guarantee 100% accuracy and uh, the ability to evade parry for all units nearby, which basically for most of the game, I've been running my uh, main character with a Scorpion for this reason. I'm actually only, I literally only yesterday switched over to the Dark Spear because I found one and because I find it funny to finally have a reason to have concentration on a Rune Fencer. Don't judge me. Moving on. Uh, <laughs> Alright, other fun little debuffs here. Uh, we have something like Mother's Blessing, just causes the uh, next heal to be uh, double effective. Nothing particularly fancy there. Um, Apostate, Evade, uh, there's a lot of different versions of these. Uh, Intercession, Ivory Tower. All these are just different durations of, um, of being able to completely avoid physical or magical attacks uh, in different amounts. So, for example, like Ivory Tower 2 will ignore three physical attacks. Meanwhile, something like Evade will allow them to nullify one physical attack, whereas Apostate 2 would allow them to avoid three magic attacks, but Intercession would allow them to evade one magic attack. It, it's just different flavors of the same deal, more or less. All right, next up, let's go ahead and talk about stop. Uh, these used to be bind, shackle, and stop in the PSP version. Um, this is just simply stop now, which is funny because something like Stinky Feet, as far as this patch, still calls it shackle because this is what it used to do. But basically, shackle would break the arms, bind would break the legs, and stop would do what stop does now. They would always overwrite each other in the PSP version, which is why, for example, when fairies uh, had um, uh, had some of their dance moves, they would inflict Bind, Shackle, and Stop at the same time. A lot of the moves did. So, like, Stop was kind of the ultimate best version, and then the other two were weaker versions of it that could roll as well. In this one, they just figured, screw it, you know what, nobody's bothering with figuring all of this out, let's just put it as Stop, it's the best one anyway. And so that's what ends up happening here. So, uh, stop will, as, as it says, stop uh, the unit from having their next turn, but it will allow stuff like poison to keep on ticking. So, for example, shield bashing somebody onto a swamp tile so that they take uh, local poison damage, and then also putting poison on them, and then putting stop and stun on them, or, for example, stop and, uh, it, well, the petrify trick is a bit different, but if you, if you just put uh, stop on them, they will sit there and uh, take multiple ticks of poison at the same time. It's pretty great. Additionally, if you have somebody stuck on a swamp tile, and you repeatedly petrify them, you technically can cause them to just slowly sink into the mud and die. So, you know, that's a thing too. Very cruel, very time consuming, but hey, sometimes a unit just deserves it. All right, next up we got Hobble, uh, which will just uh, cause units to have one less movement. Doesn't seem like much, but it it can be just enough. Like, this is, the Cyclops is one of these units that's just, that's just absolutely terrifying in terms of like, taking a bunch of minor stuff and just spamming it to a degree that's horrifying. Um, like, you know, just have a chance to stop on their hits, have a chance to uh, hobble enemy units all around to the point that they can't keep up with you. Uh, just stun everything within two tiles and then just suddenly all their turns melt away. It is... It's a weird time with this guy. <laughs> it's just a strange unit and I love it. Anyway. So, uh, let's see, what else? Uh, that, I mean... What else do we want to cover here? Uh, stuff like uh, Rapier Glance, uh, stuff uh, like... Um, yeah, let's go ahead and talk about uh, talk about Threaten for a second. So some moves will also have secondary effects, like for example, uh, Threaten will, uh, have, will get rid of MP by 25%, as well as Silence Enemy Units. This is just kind of universally good for terrifying things around a Juggernaut. Technically, this is two different debuffs. Technically, one's not really a debuff, arguably. Either way, just kind of a fun thing there. Um, technically, this is more a removal of a debuff than an actual debuff. Uh, but skill conditions, these are just prepared moves that you have on hand. Something like Intimidate can get rid of them. So while you can inflict Sleep or Petrify and just have them waste their turn and then they disappear in some cases, something like Intimidate can get rid of them beforehand. Again, situationally useful. Kind of use as you will type of a situation there. Um, Alright. So, uh, let's see other interactions here. I believe that's all I realistically want to cover at this point, because I just noticed that uh, 
kind of running a little bit short on time here. Oh, as far as dealing with debuffs, just so you know, if you have a griffin that you like, just put Feather Step on them uh, if you're ever afraid of leaden. This causes them to still have the ability to fly. Um, okay. And I think that'll be just about everything. Just always pay attention to your item buffs. Always pay attention to your elemental weaknesses. Um, like, uh, the, again, one thing I, I brought up during Nothing Burger, it's amazing how many people will, for example, bring uh, Divine Element Clerics into the Nimbeth fight and then wonder why they got one shot. And it's because Dark immediately opposes Light. They just, I mean, you got a guy that's essentially doing a whole bunch of damage, a unit with functionally no armor on them. And uh, basically they have a gigantic elemental weakness from a guy that can, you know, snipe them with impunity. Yeah, that's going to be a bit of a problem. So just always kind of bear those weaknesses in mind. If you see a scary looking unit, that's when you need to pay attention to what uh, element units you're sending in to go deal with them. No, this doesn't mean that they can't take it whatsoever. Actually, in some cases, you can potentially abuse this. Um, again, I was showing this off in a previous video, but like, say for example, you've got a fire element boss and you've got a, uh, You've got this favorite, like, ice element frontliner you absolutely want to go bring against this boss. You know, you're mad at me for suggesting you shouldn't bring them, how dare I? And so, for example, like, let's say you bring them in and you decide, okay, they're, like, let's say the guy is a physical hitter, right? We go and we go ahead and we give them dodge, we go ahead and we uh, give them a uh, base on time to, uh, to fortify. Um, we go ahead and, uh, like, let's say, actually, let's, let's even replace the dodge because they're a sword master. So let's go ahead and replace that with a brand. So suddenly you throw the brand on them. Uh, they're they're going to be doing roughly 15, 20% uh, less uh, scaling damage based on time. Once again, just kind of uh, scaling that uh, defense in your favor. Like, let's say they wanted to, I don't know, let, let's say they wanted to uh, go have a few healing items on there. So we'll just go ahead and throw that on them as well. You know, just whatever happens to be on hand. This is just some random stuff. Um, and so, for example, right here, they can functionally neuter the guy, but at the same time, as far as the AI sees it, they're still like, wait, there, there's an elemental weakness, I'm gonna go attack that. So let, like, let's say they've got uh, something like Preempt, they've got Falling Blade, they've got Mind's Eye, suddenly they, they've got multiple chances to roll a chance to completely avoid this guy's attacks, they're gonna completely keep going, you know, aggressively against this unit they've got a weakness against, and they, essentially you can have, you can turn this weakness into a strength in your favor. Because again, all they're seeing is, wait, I can potentially do big number versus this unit. And it's like, wait, but I can completely nullify the damage that, you know, the physical damage that they'd be using, they're doing in this situation. So there we go. I can just abuse the hell out of, of the fact that they've got a strength against this guy. So that's kind of how you want to be thinking about it. That you want to be thinking like, how can I take this thing that's a problem for me and turn it into a problem for the other guy? Okay. Debuffs are usually going to be the best way to do that. Anyway, I'm out of time for today. So... Thank you guys for watching. Uh, if you have any questions, do leave them here and I'll go ahead and answer them as soon as I can. So I also just noticed I forgot to actually put petrification on that list in terms of what it does. Basically, it does uh, disable a unit for a number of turns like the other ones, but it actually uh, has a few other bits and pieces too. So it increases physical defense pretty dramatically, increases magic defense a little bit, and then also uh, turns the unit into a sort of heavy status, uh, meaning that they're uh, less likely to be knocked back. Um, now, the rules for this have changed uh, in this version, so uh, you can actually, uh, you can knock back heavy units uh, with pretty much anybody, it seems, but it does seem like the default knockback chance is a decent bit lower, and it also feels like just the odds are higher with another heavy unit knocking back uh, the, uh, uh, the petrified unit this time around. Uh, also, another quick uh, note, just like I mentioned earlier, it, uh, if you petrify, normally uh, petrification will get rid of poison, the two of them are exclusive. Um, basically, sleep and poison, as well as petrification and poison, are exclusive. Um, but uh, if you were to um, if you were to petrify somebody on top of a hazard tile, like a swamp tile, uh, they will still continue taking poison damage during that time. Uh, but it's the kind of a quarter damage poison in that particular case. Uh, so yeah, you don't have the whole like double stacking venom thing from PSP thing. Um, anyway, that'll be that. All right, take care. See you next time.